Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Is your worship pleasing to God? That is, on a daily basis, do you go before Him, thanking Him, exalting His name, praising Him, living your life with a sense of gratitude that the very blood of the Son of God has been poured out for you? Because we're called to be thankful people who live a praiseworthy and a life that's full of worship. And when we look at this prophecy from Yoel, we're going to find that as the last days approach, there is going to be less and less worship. People are not going to be focusing upon God, but they're going to be focusing upon self, their desires, and moving away from what is pleasing to God. If you got your Bible, and look with me to this prophecy. Now, Joel is only 73 verses. Some chapters have more than that number of verses in them, but the entire prophecy, 73 verses. And in this prophecy, there's an emphasis upon what's called the day of the Lord. And make no mistake about it, that term, the day of the Lord, is a term of judgment. It is a term of wrath. It is a term of God's anger falling upon the world. And the vast majority of God's people were not sensitive to the signs, to the things that will be taking place before this judgment falls. So the question is this. Are we going to be ready? Are we going to be found faithful? Are we going to be faithful witnesses of the truth of God prior to God's judgment falling, or are we going to be reflecting the things of the world rather than the things of the kingdom? Look with me to verse 1. Now, the name Yoel, or Joel, it's really, according to the scholars, the name for that sacred term for the Lord, that yud heh vav -Hey, two of those letters, and also the name for God. So his name, most believe, is simply a reference to the Lord God. And it's an emphasis. It is trying to tell the reader that God is, is serious about this word, about what he's going to do to establish a transition from this world into the age to come. And the question is this, are we going to be ready, are we going to be faithful and moving from this world into the kingdom? Or is it going to catch us by surprise, unprepared for what must happen? Look at verse 1. The word of the Lord, which was to Yoel, the son of Petuel. And then notice, he uses two verbs in the next verse. The first one, to hear, and the second one, to give ear to. And notice he's speaking to two groups of people. First of all, the leadership, and then all the people. But notice what he says in verse 2. He says here, hear this, O elders. Now, this word, this, it's in the feminine, and when it stands alone, it's speaking about the primary concern, the main objective of God. And this word here means listen for the purpose of responding, implementing God's truth in your life. Not just hearing and moving on, but rather take this message, apply it to your life so that you are giving a proper response to this revelation. So he says here, listen to this, O elders, and give ear all the inhabitants of the land. 
Now, here, most scholars believe the land is not a reference to all the world, even though this prophecy is for the entire world. This prophecy is going to affect all of creation. But in a unique way, he's speaking about the people who dwell in the land, precisely the land of Israel. So he says, listen to this, O elders, give ear all the inhabitants of the land, And then he says a question. He says, has there ever been something like this before? Has there been something like this in your days or in the days of your forefathers? And the emphasis here is something unique, something different, something that's never been before is about ready to happen. So we need to be someone who are able to discern the times, to see and identify the unique time that this is referring to. And I believe as we look at other prophecies that we are approaching, we are drawing near to when this word from Joel is going to be very relevant for all creation. Now look at verse 3. Concerning this once more, this, this, He's saying something foundational. There is something primary about this prophecy in regard to what God wants to do. And that is, understandably, he's speaking about judgment and wrath. And judgment and wrath, they must be poured out for the kingdom of God to be manifested. Now, I say that a lot, but the problem is this. More and more teachers are removing this idea of a God who will judge, a God who will put forth wrath. They want to say, oh, that's the Old Testament God. That's not relevant for today. But when we look at the scripture prophetically, we're going to see, and here's the the stumbling block. See, we need to realize something. The church is not going to be successful. Meaning this. We are not going to carry out our call in a way that brings about a change in the world in a meaningful way. Meaning this, we are not going to see the world gets more righteous, that there's going to be justice, that there's going to be peace, that we're going to usher in a a good time of, of justice, righteousness, peace, and blessing. More and more theological seminaries, you'll see books being written about this idea that we are going to make a change. We are going to usher in a time period of of great, great godliness and righteousness in this world. Well, that may be nice to think of, but it's totally false. We don't have any prophets that say such a thing. Quite the contrary. The prophets tell us that things are going to get worse. And when we look out, even with our eyes, with a little bit of biblical discernment, we see things are getting worse. And the message of all the prophets, the message of Paul, the message of Messiah, is that things are going to get worse. What did Messiah say? In the last days, there's going to be wars, rumors of wars, famines, earthquake, pestilence. There's going to be persecution. Believers are going to be hated. When we look at the simple message of Messiah for the last days, there is nothing that tells us that things are going to get better. No, things are going to get worse. And we know when we look at the church that there's going to be apostasy. That is a moving away from the right doctrine. There is going to be that which is heretical being taught by an increasing number of believers. So when we look here, At verse 3, notice what he says. He says, concerning this, and this is going to be the heart of his prophecy, concerning it to your sons, tell this to. Also to your sons, their sons. And their sons, their sons, until what? Now, the last part of verse 3 says, dor acher, which many Bibles may say to a different generation. But that word, acher, well, it could be achar, which is the last or the later generation. Speaking about 
what he's referring to here is going to go from generation to generation, and it has its relevance for this last generation. And when we look about this last generation, this generation of change, this generation of transition, notice what he says in verse 4. He uses a very clear image, that of, of locusts. Now, I don't know how it's translated in your Bible, but it gives four different types of locusts. And the rabbinical commentators say each one is worse. Each type of locust does greater damage. So if you look at verse 4, it says, And what was left over from the hagazam, that is the first type of locusts, it's going to be eaten up by the second, by the arbe. And then what they leave is going to be eaten up by the yelech, which is the third type. And whatever they leave is going to be eaten up by ha-chatzil. And this word chatzil means to liquidate totally, meaning to eat up everything so that there's absolutely nothing left. And these ideas of locusts has to do with a punishment, a judgment where God is going to be consuming. So make no mistake about it. God is going to act in the last days to bring about emptiness. Why? Well, where this prophecy is going to point to is insufficient worship. That God's people, his covenant people, and we can say his old covenant people, and also his new covenant people, that we are not worshiping God properly. There is not a sufficiency to him for our worship. We're not trusting him. We're not relying upon how he wants us to worship him. And what Joel is going to reveal to us is this. Because of the insufficiency of our worship, that it's not pleasing to him, it is not done appropriately, that he finds no favor in it, because of that, there's going to be an emptiness. God is going to remove his blessings. He is going to remove his provision. And we're going to find that when that happens, we'll watch out. Because that is going to be an opportunity for the enemy. And that's exactly where he goes in this prophecy. Look now to, to verse 5. He says, wake up. And that means, it's a word which literally means come to an end. So we're coming to an end of one epoch of time. And something else is going to begin. Look at verse 5. Come to an end or wake up those who are drunk. Now, the word drunk, you're going to see that this is going to be rooted in wine. There's an emphasis in this fifth verse about wine. And biblically speaking, usually when wine is spoken of, or sometimes being drunk with wine, it's speaking about a desire to find pleasure from the things of this world. Not rejoicing in the Lord, not finding favor in Him, but the things of this world. So he says in verse 5, basically, cut it out. Those who are drunk, those who are finding pleasures in this creation, apart from God, not according to His will, or doing the commandments as a means of finding satisfaction. He says, when he looks at humanity, he says, uh, basically, stop this. And you need to do what? Weep. In fact, he says, let all those, and here it is, drink wine. All those who's emphasizing the things of this world, he says, let them, let them not only weep, but he says, let them lament. Concerning the new wine, that is the future wine. It has to do with the wine that's going to produce. And the message is this, he's cutting it off. He is going to bring an end of joy. Right now, many people, they find much temporal satisfaction. I want to emphasize that. They find much temporal satisfaction in the things of this world. But there's coming a time what Joel is saying is that people will not find any happiness, any joy, any pleasure in what he's going to bring about. And what's he talking about? Well, we'll see in a moment. The day of the Lord. 
That day of the Lord is going to cause a great transition, a different way of thinking. God is going to reveal himself in a clear way. So he says this, this new wine is going to be cut off from your mouth. Verse 6. Now we see not just a foreshadowing of judgment, but notice what he says in verse 6. For a nation. Now, usually here in this context, we're talking about a group of people who have no covenantal relationship with God. And here we're speaking about an enemy that is coming. And this enemy, well, there's two interpretations. One is that it is a satanic nation, a satanic army. The other is simply that, that it is God using such, such evilness in order to accomplish his purpose. Verse 6, verse six says, For a nation goes up upon my land. And this, this nation is strong and there is no number. That is, they cannot be counted. They are so, so numerous. Likewise, he says, their teeth are like the teeth of a lion. And their molars, that is their largest teeth, are like a teeth of a lion, but he uses a different word. Instead of using the word arie, which he used previously in this verse, he uses the word la vie, which has to do with a young, strong, powerful, angry lion. So he says there's a nation, an angry, powerful nation that is coming without number and is strong. And he says, what's going to happen? Well, look at verse 7. Now, this punishment that's coming, first and foremost, it's going to be placed upon God's old covenant people. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, he's not pleased with them. And when we look prophetically, we see in the last days, God is not going to be pleased with Israel. We might love Israel, and we do. We pray for the peace of Israel. We want that, but realize something. Israel is going to be far removed from God as these last days begin. And if you were to pay attention like I do to what the rabbis are saying, just like Rivka talked about there's Christian networks, there's also in Israel two or three rabbinical networks. And when you listen to what they are sharing about the spiritual condition of Israel, it's far, far removed from prophetic truth in the same way that there is heresy and there is apostasy within christianity today and many people are teaching as i said earlier that we're going to be successful that we're going to make the world a better place that we're going to prepare this world for messiah and when he comes here he's going to be so pleased that everything is so godly and just and holy and righteous that it's all prepared for him that's what's popular today many books are being written about this. But you know what books are not written in that way? Prophetic books from the Scripture. No, things are not going to get better. They're going to get worse. And this is what Joel is telling us. And God is going to be very angry with the old covenant people. He's not going to allow them to continue in this disobedience. He is not going to allow the false teaching that they receive to Go on and on. He is going to bring something about which, well, Judaism does not acknowledge today. No, the most popular thought in Judaism today is Megia Lanu et which means we deserve the Messiah. We deserve the kingdom. One of the most famous rabbis, he died about 15 years ago, but one of the most famous ones, he stood, and you can watch this in YouTube, he spoke in Yiddish, but there's English subtitles. And he stands and says this. He says, why the kingdom is not revealed? Why God does not bring about this final redemption that he's promised? He says, I have no explanation. Because he says, I look at my people and I see them as righteous. I see them as a, a position of being meritable before God, meaning that they have merit, that they deserve these blessings. 
That's what they hear. But when we look prophetically, we find that's not the case. God is going to bring up an enemy. He is going to punish. Why? Because he has forsaken? No. In order to bring about, as we'll see in the second session tonight, to bring about repentance. Look now, if you would, to verse 7. Why are we focusing upon Israel? Because he says, I have set my thine to destruction. And this word gephen in Hebrew is a reference to his old covenant people, the Jewish people, Israel. And he says, not only have I set them as desolation or destruction, he says, and my fig tree, he says, I'm going to lay them bare and I'm going to cast the branch out and they are going to become white, meaning this. They're going to just dry out. And instead of showing any life, this idea of a white branch is synonymous with, with death. He said, that's where Israel's heading, to spiritual and physical death. How should they be thought of in the last days? Look at verse 8. He says, unto me as a virgin bride. Now, what's he mentioning here? A virgin bride, and it's the word bitula for virgin. We would think, well, a virgin shouldn't be married. Well, this is at the very beginning. A virgin bride, she will put on sackcloth because of the husband of her youth, meaning this. She has just been married, and before that marriage can be consummated, what happens? Her husband is struck dead. And what this scripture is saying is that because of death, spiritual death, there's a separation between God the Father, God the husband of Israel, and his people. God is very displeased. And by the way, when we look at this first chapter, what we're going to focus in in this first session, there's no good news. And that's why people don't study this today. We may take bits and pieces from Joel, but by and large, we don't read it. Because it does not fit our own desire, our own thought, our own theology for what's going to happen in the last days. What does God say? Look, if you would, to verse 9. He says, for the mincha and the nesach. What's that? Two different types of offerings. The mincha was the afternoon offering. And the nesach, that was the libation. This is type of a, an offering that we might think of the icing on the cake. It is an additional one. One that, that is seek, sought for, for favor, so it's added because they want more from God. And what he says here is that they are cut off from the house of the Lord. Meaning this, God, there's two interpretation. That they're not being done anymore. That the people aren't interested in offering anything to God. Why? Well, one theologian, a rabbinical one, simply says this. Because the people don't care about thanking God anymore. They don't have a spirit of gratitude. They're not interested in showing their appreciation. The other is this. That because of his judgment, there's nothing to offer God. The people have nothing because the land is not producing any harvest. So look again at verse 9. These two type of offerings, the mincha and the nesach, has been cut off from the house of the Lord. And what should the people be doing? This is where God's bringing his people. He says, mourn. Let the priests, let them mourn who are the servants of the Lord. Now, he's saying here that the leadership should be the first ones who discern this. The spirit, if we're the leaders... We should be the ones who have the greatest amount of discernment that we should be able to glean from the events, what we see and what we read, the spiritual condition of the people. And what God is calling them to do is to show the example by mourning. Look at verse 10. Now, in verse 10, we see something that's consistent. When we study the prophecy of Amos, that is Amos, about eight years ago here in, in Cocoa Beach, we see the same thing. That the prophets would look at the produce of the land, the yield of the field, the harvest. 
And when there was not any, they knew why. Because of the spiritual condition of the people. When there's no yield, it's because there's no worship going on. And that's what we see in verse 10. It says, for the field is plundered. Now, I don't know how your Bible translates it, but it's a world word for something being stolen, something being taken away. And the idea here is this, that God is taking away the harvest of the land. And therefore, it says, and the ground will mourn because the grain has been robbed and therefore the new wine will be ashamed or withered up. And it will be miserable, that is, afflicted. It will not be of any produce, this word for oil, meaning olive oil. And these three things that are mentioned here in the scripture, Dagon for grain, Tirosh for new wine, and Yitzhar for oil, these three words are, are always repeated in prophecy about if there's harvest that's good, God is pleased with the spiritual condition of Israel. If there's no harvest, then God's not pleased with the spiritual condition of Israel. And notice verse 11. It's not just the problem with the land, but notice what he says. He says, the farmers, verse 11, they will be ashamed. And the vineyard workers or owners, depending upon how we render this word, they are going to lament concerning the wheat and the barley. Now, the wheat and the barley, it's done in the spring of the year. And it concludes this wheat and barley harvest, conclude with the Feast of Shavuot or Pentecost. And that is a time of provision. And what it's saying here is, there's not going to be any provision. There's not going to be any outcome. There's not going to be a harvest that shows God's favor and his faithfulness to the people. Why? Look at the end of verse 11. For the harvest of the field has perished. And it hasn't done it by itself. It's not simply bad luck. No, it has been made to perish. God has brought destruction upon the land. Why? Because of the spiritual condition of the people. When we look prophetically, the state of the land, the condition of the harvest reflects the spiritual condition of the people. Verse 12. And the vine is withered up. The figs are, are miserable. And this word miserable means when you look at it, you see a, a state of decay, a lack of fruitfulness. So he says, this vine is withered up, and the figs are, are in the most miserable condition. And the pomegranate tree, also the palm tree with dates, and the apple tree, in fact, he says, all the trees of the field. Now, that should be a, a well-known statement. Because when Israel repents, when Israel gets right with God, what do the trees of the field do? They clap. They rejoice, they praise, they worship. But that's not what's happening here. Just the opposite. No, all the trees of the field, they dry up, they wither away. Why is that? Because the gladness or the joy have withered up from who? The sons of men, that is humanity. Now, what this prophecy does is to remind the reader of something very important. Because when we look here, the emphasis is upon Israel, upon the Jewish people. Those two words, the, the vine and the fig tree. Prophetically, two terms that reflect, relate to the Jewish people, the children of Israel. But when we come to the end of verse 12, we find that he broadens that term. And speaking about a phrase that relates to humanity, not just Israel but all of humanity. And this is the message that we should take away from it. And that is, when Israel's not right with the Lord, the nations won't be right with the Lord. But if Israel repents and turns to God, then that will bring the nations 
to them. You say, where's that scene in the scripture? Well, think about Zechariah chapter 8. There when Israel sees God, the God of Jacob, and responds, what happens? For every Jew, there's at least 10 Gentiles that says, we have heard God is with you. We want to go up to the house of Israel, to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem with you. But this is not happening here. It's just the opposite. And notice how verse 12 ends. For the sasson, the joy. And this word for joy, not the typical one. It's usually the word simcha or the word gil. But here, sasson, some say that this means a joy that's, that's unable to hold back. Yet you can't conceal it. You can't hide it. You can't stop it. It's a natural joy that comes from the intimacy and the blessings and God's presence with the people. But it's not there. So what should we do? Look now to verse 13. He says here, gird yourself. Now, this idea of girding yourself is to take off normal clothes, normal clothes of honor, and put on sackcloth. He says here, gird yourself and lament. Who's he speaking to first and foremost? The leaders, the koanim, the priests. And then he says, and lament all servants of the altar. Here again, a reference to the priests and the Levites. Come and lament in sackcloth all servants of my God. For withheld from the house of your God, this is the second time he says it, for withheld from the temple, the house of my God, is this grain offering and this water libation. What it's saying is this. The people aren't interested in worshiping God. They are not desiring to show thanksgiving. They're not interested in praising him. There is no worship. And all of this is to tell us what the spiritual condition is going to be of Israel in the last days. Look at verse 14. What will bring about a change? What is the leadership of God's people supposed to do? Verse 14 tells us. It says, sanctify a fast. Now, fasting always is accompanied by prayer, and fasting is always seeking God. So he says, proclaim or sanctify a fast. And then he says, proclaim, and it's a word, your Bible may say an assembly, but it's word atzara. And atzara comes from the Hebrew word latzor, which means to stop. So what he's saying here is whatever we do normally, cut it out. Stop. Don't go on with life in a normal fashion. But, but there's a proclamation of stopping everything in order that the elders may be gathered and all the inhabitants of the land to where? To the house of the Lord, your God. And let them cry out. And this is a change of word. It's a word which means to cry out in great despair. So let them cry out to the Lord. What do they cry out? Look at verse 15. It says, alas. Now that word means, first of all, it is a word of acknowledgement. It's a word of discerning something. The people have realized, based upon the spiritual condition of the land, what is not taking place, no harvest, no fruitfulness, no ability to even offer sacrifices because the land has given nothing. They realize something. This word is aha in Hebrew. And it literally means it's a word of discovery, it's a word of acknowledgement, but it also has within it a word of or a thought of how terrible something's going to be if there's not a change. What are they discovering? Look again at verse 15. They are discovering that this is the day. What day? The day of the Lord. For it says, aha, it is the day. For close is the day of the Lord, 
And notice what it says. As a thief from the Almighty, that is Shaddai, uh, that is El Shaddai, but it's just Shaddai, it will come. Now, this is important because here we have an Old Testament reference for this idea of, of God's judgment coming how? As a thief in the night. And here's what upsets me. So many times I'll be speaking to a group and I'll say, Messiah's coming how? And people will say, believers will say, as a thief in the night. Not for us. We should never think that that idea of him coming as a thief in the night relates to believers. He doesn't come for us that way. How do we know that? Read some time, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness. What are we? Children of light. That that day should not come upon us as a thief in the night. He's not coming for believers as a thief in the night. He's going to come and he is going to gird himself. We find in the book of Luke. He is going to come and gird himself and minister unto us. He's coming to serve, to heal, to comfort. But to those who are still present during this time of the day of the Lord, we won't be here. But for those who are, it's going to come as a thief. And primarily it's here for Israel and the nations. The sad truth is that in the last days, there's not going to be that much difference between how Israel's living and how the nations are. Those who have a covenant relationship with God, they're not going to be any discernible difference between them and those who do not. And that is shameful. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this. When God looks at you, when he looks at you, does he see a difference, a discernible difference between how we live, how we think, what delights us, what are we pursuing, and those who do not know him? That's a sobering question. Look at verse 16. For surely before our eyes, the food, the sustenance. Now, if your Bible says meat, it's not meat. It's simply the word ochel. Food in the most general sense, sustenance, has been cut off from the house of the Lord. Here again, the rabbinical commentators, they say that the world is in such a situation that there's nothing to be able to even offer it up to God. Others look at it differently and say, when we look at this passage, for the sustenance has been cut off from the house of Of the Lord, meaning this, God's not blessing. God's not giving. God's not ministering. God's not moving in the world. Why? Where's the simcha and the guilt? Where's the gladness and the joy? Two words that relates to worship. And what he's saying here in this verse is, because the people are not worshiping me as I demand to be worshipped. They're not following the biblical truth concerning worshiping me that I'm not going to bless, I'm not going to give sustenance for them. Verse 17. And then he calls the people to look. Look at their situation. He says the grain or the seeds have become moldy. They are all together with clogs of of dirt, meaning that, that they put them into the ground and when they take them up, they're moldy and there's just clops of dirt with them. And also the the granaries, they are destroyed. And the silos, they are torn down because all the grain has become withered. And the animals, look at verse 18. For the animals, they groan. The, The cattle, they are confused. For there is no pasture for them. And also the herds of the flock, meaning sheep, they are ashamed. Meaning that they're going to be so skinny, their fur or wool is going to be in such a a form of, of sickness, not normal, that the animals are going to be ashamed of how they look. Why is that? Because a lack of true spiritual worship. Verse 19. 
Unto the Lord I will call. Now, this is the prophet Yoel. He is saying, in the midst of these things, what should we do? He says, in the midst of this, unto the Lord I will call. He says, for fire is going to consume the midst of these good places in the wilderness. And he says that they are going to be like flames of fire that destroy all the trees of the field. And the animals of the field, they are going to pant unto you. They are going to lament as well for their condition. Because all the brooks, the channels of water, they have dried up. For fire has consumed. Consumed, and the word here, naot, is like an oasis in the wilderness or the desert. So the prophet's saying, I, in the midst of all of these things, I am going to call out unto the Lord. Why is that? Because Yoel knows something. That even in the midst of this, it's not for Israel's destruction. It is not because God wants to destroy his people, but he wants to call them to repentance. And that's exactly what we're going to see when we begin chapter 2. That Joel, at the end of chapter 1, he is showing leadership. That look at these things and don't do like the world's going to do and kind of raise their fists. Curse the Lord for the situation they're going to be in. No, Joel is going to be a leader in turning to God in repentance in order that there might be a restoration. See, here's the problem. Israel, and this is so true today, Israel does not recognize its need for restoration. Israel doesn't recognize its need for change and transformation. And because Israel does not, here's the the biblical principle. Because Israel does not, neither will the world. But when Israel changes and repents and turns to God, it is going to bring about transformation of the nations as well. And that's why it's so important that we take seriously and pray, that is, seek God's will to bring about change in the Jewish people. And we need to ask ourselves, as we support Israel, are we doing so just for their physical needs? Those needs which are temporary, that are here today and they die tomorrow? Or are we emphasizing their spiritual need? What needs to happen in order for them to repent and embrace their God? Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.